morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. It is so nice to be here. So nice to be here. Yeah, I'm sorry. You got the downgrade today. The pretty pastor isn't here. Um, but hello to Myra, Pastor Myra, and our tour. Wonderful people. Thank you as a daddy for loving them so well. And they love you. They send their love. So, uh, anyway, my name is Ken Philbin, um, but my friends call me Ken, so you can call me Ken. Amen? Amen. Um, communion Sunday. Um, um, I hope everyone has their elements. We'll do communion after the sermon today. Uh, I was praying as I was coming up, Lord, make the guy good. Don't let him bore us. Amen. Um, before I start, I'd like to pray, have you pray with me for me, because I don't want people's opinions. Um, there are people that are a whole lot smarter than me, but I, I would rather hear from God. Amen? Amen? So if you would just hold your hand out to me, and I'm actually going to pray for me, but you pray along with me. Um, Lord God Almighty, you are our friend, but you are the uncreated one the high king of heaven, the majestic one. And Lord, it is so humbling to know that you use us, frail human beings. Lord, I believe you can speak through me. I believe you can speak your words. We want to hear from you. Thank you for your living and dynamic word, the words that saved our hearts and brought us first to you, for your love is what drew us to you. But Lord, you, your, your words are the manna, the manna from heaven that feed our souls. And Lord, your love is the living waters that give us life. Use us, open our ears and our eyes, our hearts, and let us learn from you this morning through your wonderful word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, Today, our text is coming out of Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to talk about um, our words and how important our words are. Can you imagine for an entire day if you could not speak? I know. For people, I can talk wallpaper off a wall. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm never short on words, but... <laughs> I mean, what do you do, hand puppets? Words are extremely important, extremely important. And Jesus tells the, us that, but he tells us more in Matthew 12, and we're in verse 35. And uh, Jesus says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. <coughs> for by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Years ago I had a youth uh, group, and I was the youth pastor, and I remember, you know, you always have to worry about gossip and lying and those kind of things. And, and I remember trying to, I was praying about how in the world, Lord, do I communicate how important being honest is? How important it is to be trustworthy? And I remember talking with them about it. And, and a number of them were just, I loved them. They were just straightforward, honest. And they said, well, everybody lies. Everybody lies. Little white lies, big I guess they're black if they get big enough. I don't know what a white lie is. It just sounds, shouldn't even be white. It should be black. Every lie should be black. But I remember talking to them about it. And they are all saying, but you know, it's human to lie. I mean, it's hard not to lie. And I mean, there's so many excuses. And I wrote down some of the things that, that I, I, you know, we had talked about. And, and, they, and they would say things like, well, I really, you know, if they got caught in a lie, well, I really didn't mean that. What I meant was, or did I really say that? You know, act like, or or you took me wrong. Um, or they'll say, well, 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 you made me say it. You made me mad. So I I exaggerated. Or um, 
I only said that because I was upset. You know how we don't tell the truth because we want to blame the person that, that's calling us out or um, things like, um, you know that makes me mad and it's just hard not to hold my temper back. Or, um, But then there's the compassionate lie. You know, well, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. Ooh, that sounds almost Christian, you know, right? Um, how about the embarrassment lie? Well, I didn't want to embarrass myself, or I didn't want to embarrass you or them. Um, or the fearful lie, I was afraid you would be mad if I told you the truth. There's the helpful lie, well, I was afraid they would be fired if I told my boss the truth. Um, there's even the practical lie. Sometimes people can't handle the truth. Do you remember that movie? You can't handle the truth. <sighs> Jesus is very, very serious about his words. And Jesus' followers are called to be equally as serious. Matter of fact, one of the names of Jesus is the Word. How about that? Can you imagine being so trustworthy that your dad says, he tells the truth so much, he is the truth. Isn't Jesus called the truth? Years and years and years ago, there was a uh, slave, the slave trade was going on. And uh, the story goes that there was a young black man standing on a block of wood, ready to be auctioned. And one of the slave owners came up to him and he said, Son, if I buy you, will you tell me the truth? And in a very respectful way, he said, Sir, whether you buy me or not, I'll tell the truth. Wow. Wow. Um, that, that, that's a mean of character. I'm going to tell the truth whether, whether you're my owner or you're just someone I'm talking to. What kind of fruit is in your heart? You know, one of the things about Jesus is he offends me all the time because he cuts right through the, the, the facade. You know, you know they, they pick on people on Facebook and they say, well, they only post the nice stuff. Well, think a little deeper than that. Most of the time, we only present to everyone we see the nice stuff. But what's hidden in the heart? You can't see. I mean, you all look so holy today. Man, look at you guys, spiritual giants. Right? We know how to look holy. We know how to look serious. But the thing that I love about Jesus is he doesn't let me get away with a Facebook face. He cuts through to the heart. And you know what the saddest part about our words most of the time, we use our harshest words for those we love the most. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? That's why I love my, my big brother, Jesus. Because he says, little bro, own what's in your heart. Look deep in your heart. Because your words will reveal what's in your heart. Amen? Amen? You know, it's fascinating when you, 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 you take a sponge and you put it in water and you pull it out and it drips off some stuff, but there's water that's sort of held in it. And it's only pressure, the squeezing, that just wrings out the rest of the water. Unfortunately, we can pretend that we have nice stuff in our hearts when really we're not right. When really inside we're hurt. You know, I find I'm the most vicious when I'm hurt. When, when I'm, that's when I feel justified of hurting you because you hurt me. It's just justice. It's just being fair, right? You hurt me, well, you deserve that. But Jesus says, no, 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 that's not my way. That's not the way, I, what I've called you to do. Do you have a problem with your tongue at times? I do. I do. Thanks for that laugh, because we should all be laughing right now. <laughs> you know, <sighs> the thing I love about my Jesus, our Jesus, 
is that all of the ways to heaven, he offers the best. I'm so glad I'm, I'm not, a, a, you know, Judaism, Islam are all works. You have to earn God's love and respect. You know what I love about our Jesus? You know what he does? He loves us first. He loves us ahead of time. He says, you don't have to earn my love. I love you anyway. One of the best reasons to be honest is because our Jesus is honest. You know, you know, a lot of the, all the other religions are works oriented, like I said. So you don't lie to make points. I, I was raised Catholic and I can remember, you know, thinking, oh, every good deed I earn points. And, and when I felt like I had more points than somebody else, I was like, okay, you know, I'm getting there. <laughs> Someday you'll be like me. But here we are. Here we are. And I love kneeling before Jesus because Jesus says, you don't earn my love by what you do. You prove you love me. The best motivation for telling the truth, the best motivation isn't because I'm going to get spanked by God. Isn't because, oh, well, I'll lose my points. It's because that's what my God is like. And after all he's done to put peace and love in my heart, what else, what would be, why wouldn't I want to love like him? It was the pagans, when you read through the book of Acts and the book of An in, in, in Antioch, um, a, a pagan city where, where the uh, godless, you know what they named the early Christians? Christians. They called them little Christ. Because they said they act like the guy they worship. I want to be that kind of guy. Amen? Amen? But you know what? We don't get there by hoping. We get there by drawing the line in the sand. You know, we're saved by his grace through faith. But we still need our minds to live his love. In Luke chapter 6. Now the thing about Jesus. He was an itinerant preacher. He went from town to town. Preaching pretty much sermon series. The same things. And the Sermon on the Mount is. Pardon the expression. But it's sort of like his greatest hits. He brought everything together. He brought it all together. And, and he spelled it out in a, a systematic way. I mean, he introduces, you know, the, the, the blessings. Blessings are you when you're humble because that's the only way we hear from God is to, to put down our volition, our, our, our willful self-will and say, God, you're right. Tell me what you want me to do. Correct my thinking. Correct the feelings in my heart. Teach me, God. I, I want to learn from you. I've learned that being humble is important in a lot of things, even marriage, even marriage. Most important thing a husband can learn is, is saying this to his wife, I was wrong, you were right. Is it always true? Of course not. Neither is he, right? But doesn't that show a wonderful attitude? Doesn't that show a wonderful attitude of Loving you is more important than being right. That's the sad thing about arguments. We stop loving each other and we try to be right. Is it important to be right, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. But they will know us by our love, not by our harsh arguments. Amen? Amen? In, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus... Now remember, he's an itinerant, so... Often, that's why we have the, the, the called the similar Gospels, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and they all, they heard Jesus preach these same sermons, but often Jesus would apply them differently or say them slightly differently. And that's why there's just a little bit of difference 
in the Gospels when he talks about the same thing. But Jesus says this in Luke. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, Jesus wasn't saying that once you fill your heart full of love, it stays full of love. That's not what he's saying. Neither is he saying when you're mean that your, your, your heart is always full of what, you know, meanness. But it's very, very important for us in our prayer life. And you see this all through the beautiful, the absolute beauty of the Psalms where they'll say, search my heart, God, and reveal my heart to me. Reveal my heart. Because you know what? We're all sort of deceivers. We like to put that Facebook face on. And and I'm not saying that's always bad, right? I mean, if you're having a really lousy day, and I say, how are you? I don't want to hear for 15 minutes how bad your day is. You know, okay, okay, you know. But we can, the worst part is we can deceive ourselves. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. They're evil. Well, that's sort of true, sort of not true. I mean, we all have that evil in us, right? That sinful nature. I wish we could just peel it off and leave it. I know my wife wishes I could. (laughs) But we can't. But those two natures, those two natures vie for control. And whichever one we feed controls us. I have no idea what you're thinking of right now. It could be a Big Mac. It could be, how long is this guy going? (laughs) Right? Right? What am I going to do after church today? (laughs) What do I have to do? Where are we going to go eat? But you know what? If I hang out with you long enough, I will know what's in your heart. You'll know what's in my heart. You know how? By the fruit. By the fruit that comes out of our mouth. Sometimes we honestly say, I don't know where that came from. You know, you say things like that. That's a time to realize I'm not in touch with my deepest feelings. The most dangerous feelings for me is being hurt. Because hurt turns into anger real quick, real quick. In Proverbs 18, 21, we read this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Wow. Wow. I remember years ago, um, as a much younger, much more handsome pastor, I was counseling a young man, and he... He was despondent. He was very depressed. And I remember asking him, what's going on? What's going on? Why do you think you're so depressed? And he kept saying, I don't know. You're the counselor. You're supposed to know. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. And I said, well, what influences have you had in your life and everything? You know, often we don't like to get right to what the truth is. I find in counseling a lot of times people come and they'll sit down, but they want to feel me out first. So they talk about superficial things. And then after a long time of listening and being, being assuring and caring, then the truth really comes out. And this, this young man, he looked at me and he, he started to tear up. And he said, you know, my mother used to always tell me, we never wanted you. You were simply an accident. And he said, when I got older, my mom would joke about me being an accident. And he says, my mom wasn't an evil person, but I can't get those words out of my head. Words can give life, and words can kill. Do you know there are a lot of people that we meet that are 
pardon the expression, but emotional zombies. Because there's death in their hearts. They feel dead. They've been wounded by a husband that told them they're worthless. Or a mother that degraded them and degraded them. Or a grandfather that abused them and made them feel worthless. And what we believe in our hearts colors the way we see the world. I had a really cool pair of sunglasses. I mean, these made me actually look very good. And they were cool, right? Put them on, I was like, yeah. And I liked them because they were, they were they had sort of like an orange look to them, but they really made everything vibrant. Especially like in the fall, the leaves just popped. And they were so cool that I, a lot of times I forgot I had them on. And I remember going up to pump gas and I pulled the, you know, the, the, you put your credit card in and punch your numbers and you pull it out. And I remember looking at the dial to see if the right, because I have a discount card, because I'm cheap. And I remember looking to make sure the price adjusted down and I could hardly see it. And I was like, man, I'm tapping and tapping on the, the little, you know, the little readout that you read. I'm like, what is wrong? And then I looked over at the other dials and I'm like, all oh, the dials are so dark. I forgot that I had the glasses on. Do you know what hatred does in our hearts? It darkens our eyes. It darkens the way we see people. It affects the way we interpret things. You know, sometimes when I get really hurt and mean, I can see it in their eyes. They can see little horns growing up out of my head because I'm hurting them. And that is a gross sin. We're human. We're human. We're not perfect. Jesus loves broken vessels. Amen? We all fall prey to evil words. But today I just want to emphasize how powerful words are now, just as negative as words can be, words can give life. Words can give life. To see someone and say, hey, how are you doing today? It's good to see you. What? <laughs> it's good to see you. Hey, thanks. It's good to be seen. Hey, I like that tie. Hey, I like your hair. Well, don't you look a little spiffy today? You like my new dress? You know, you like my whatever? We can speak life. Jesus is the life. There's nothing more glorious than us speaking words of life. Amen? Amen? Let me just quickly go through four things that can help us with our words, especially with all the media out there, you know, the, the, the recordings, the, uh, the words we text, the words we type and send. It helps to think through things. Often, if you wonder if you should send it, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> it's probably your heart saying, ah, red alert, red alert, and your head's going, but I want to give them a piece of my mind. Man, now that I'm an old guy, I wonder if there's any pieces left, right? We have to ask ourselves, first of all, is it true? Is what I'm going to say true? Do I know it's true? Is it gossip? Is it hearsay? Is it just that person's opinion? One of the delightful things in Scripture when you read, especially the, the letters that Paul wrote through the Holy Spirit, is Paul would always say, now this, this is my opinion, and this I got from the Lord. Of course, now it's all the Lord's words, right? But he was very cautious before he said, thus saith the Lord. One thing I found as a dad, 
is that if mama said something, it was a 50 pound weight. If mom said it, it had, you know, had pressure or it had, you know, a cred. But if I said it, it was a 500 pound weight. And one of the hardest things having three women in my life, my wife and my two beautifully successful daughters who are gorgeous anyway, um, and I might say two wonderful son-in-laws, is that especially with women, women listen to more than just the facts, the words. They listen to your tone. They listen to your heart. They're smarter than us guys. Because often when we get angry, we think about what we want to say. But women listen to how we say it. And if I would come home in a bad mood, I could set the whole house on fire by just being distant. Dad, are you okay? I'm fine. Now what did I really communicate? I'm not fine, <laughs> right? Is it true? Is it something that I want to be communicating? Now, it, you would say, but that is true. You're in a bad mood. They read you right. Yeah, but is that what I really want to communicate? Is that the truth that Jesus wants us to communicate, to let everybody know when we're in a bad mood? Hey, I'm in a bad mood. I'm just being honest. You go up to the counter and say, hey, before you do anything, I want you to know I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> right? I mean, is it true, though? We, we have to ask ourselves, am I adding to the truth? One of the, 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 the wonderful things about our justice system is they ask you to raise your hand, and they still use the Bible, but they'll say, Are, is what you're going to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Now, why do we do that? Because you can say something that's true, but if you add your opinion to it, you can color that truth into something else. When we ask ourselves, is this true? And of course, when, when I'm angry, that's not the time for me to be talking or saying things. I gotta just own it, you know? And, I, and a lot of times, one thing I love about the younger generations is that they'll, they'll, they're just, they'll just blare out and say things at times. That didn't go right. That sounded nasty. You know, they almost do a commentary on themselves sometimes. Is it true? Am I adding to the truth? Am I playing down the truth? Yes, I did say that, but... Am I shifting blame? Yeah, I got caught red-handed, but everybody does. So what are you really saying? It's okay because everybody does it? Right? But that's what I'm saying. Am I making excuses and hiding the, my real motive? Am I flattering? You know, one of the hardest things, the most challenging thing in a husband's wife is when a wife comes out after dressing herself up and saying, does this make me look fat? <laughs> Men shudder at that question. They quake. They live in dread, hoping that question will never be asked. And I've learned to say this. You know, you know you're beautiful. But obviously, you don't feel comfortable in that dress. Why don't you go put something else on that you're comfortable on? Because honestly, I've learned a long time ago, women do not dress for their husbands. They dress for the other women. They do. They do. I found out with girls. They, they'd be, we'd be coming home from church and they'd be like, I can't wait to get them. Get out of this dress. And I'm like, why are you wearing it if it's so uncomfortable? And they would say, because I look good. <laughs> I never look at women and go, oh. Your jewelry matches. Oh, I love those shoes. <laughs> right? I don't care. My wife looks beautiful in a dress. She looks beautiful in jeans. But women care. They care too much. Women 
are very hard on women. And the real issue isn't, do I feel fat or do I, does this dress look good? The question is, if you don't feel good in it, baby, go, go change. Get on something you want. Because when you feel you're attractive, in your heart of hearts, your words are better, you smile more, and the most beautiful thing in the world is my wife with her little glow in her eyes. Amen? Amen? Is it true? Is it true? Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Colossians says, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of Christ. Titus um, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised us. Amen? Proverbs 12, 19. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. You know, the problem with the lie is it might have got you out of trouble in the moment. But now you're in trouble for a long time. Amen? Amen. The next thing is, it, it is um, after we talk about is it true, is, is it kind? Is it kind? Is it respectful? I used to tell the girls, you can tell me anything you want to tell me. You just can't be disrespectful. If you hate me, say it respectfully. <laughs> That's, that's pretty interesting. What's your tone? What's your attitude like? Do people deserve to be mistreated? Is our love so shallow as to be changed by the way people treat us? If my love is that shallow that someone mistreating me can make me become evil and return evil for evil, how shallow is my love? How empty is my heart? Amen? Amen? Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, and make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for the tree is recognized by its fruit. Next, we want to ask ourselves... First, the first was, is it true? Is it kind? Let me get my notes right here. Um, are my words going to hurt? You know, a lot of times we have something hurtful to say. It's really good to say, I'm going to say something that's difficult for me to say, and I don't want to hurt you, but I think you need to hear it. You see, you're showing kindness and you're trying to let them know you're not doing this to hurt. Worst thing about hurtful words is the words hurt, but then you think, they hate me. <laughs> They're me. They're angry at me. They don't like me. So if you have something hard to say, say, you know, something harsh to your husband, say, sweetie, you know I love you. But I have to be straight honest with you. Can, can I say something? And I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I need to say, you see what you're doing? You're showing your kindness. You're showing your empathy. You're actually showing you're doing something loving. And you know what? Saying hurtful things isn't unloving. Jesus said a lot of hurtful things. But there's times to hear those kind of things. Amen? Amen? Ephesians 4.12 Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow and become in every respect the mature body of Christ who is our head. That is Christ. 1 Corinthians 13.4 Love is patient. Love is kind. Amen? 2 Timothy 2.25 Opponents must must be gently instructed. Opponents must be gently instructed in hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. Colossians 4, 6. 
Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Proverbs 16. I love Proverbs because um, Solomon is, is instructing his, his sons. And it's a daddy. Daddy talking to, to his son. How, how sweet is that? He says, the wise in heart are called discerning and gracious words promote instruction. When you say something offensive, it, it has incredible, incredible power to it. But you know what it does? It usually shuts down someone's heart. And we can't hear with our minds if our heart is shut. It reminds me of the little boy. And I've told this story a million times, so if I told it, sorry. But he, uh, he, was, he was just being obstinate, and his mother just was, called him in and said, sit down in that chair and don't move. I, sit down and don't move. He sat down, and his, he just had the worst look on his face. And his, his, he said, Mama, can I say something? And she said, sure. And he said, my body's sitting down, but my heart is standing up. <laughs> Oh, man, the transparency of that, right? The transparency of that. When I'm hurt, I'm dangerous. And when I, I get hurt, I have to discipline myself to say, Ken, be careful what you say. Right? Right? Because it's often out of hurt that we hurt the most. The third thing is, is it necessary? Is it necessary? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? There's a time to speak and a time to be quiet is what Ecclesiastes tells us. You know, if your wife is really, really tired, that's not the time for a deep talk. You know? I used to find with the girls that, that I would often ask at the dinner table, how was your day? What's going on? And they would mutter through some stuff and they just wanted to eat and go on and play or go do stuff. But if I went up 10 minutes after they went to bed, while they're sitting there and their little minds are buzzing away, and I sat at the end of the, the bed and just said, how was your day, Myra? How was your day, Anna? And their little minds were waiting, and that, they would just open up and just start talking because that was a time they could relax and they could just, in the dark, open their little hearts up and just, just tell me honestly what's going on. Do you know the best times to talk to people in your life? Come on, if it's your wife, do you know the best time to really talk to her? Everybody's different, everybody. Do you know the best time to talk to your husband? Is it when he first comes home? Or your wife for that matter? Now put some good food in his tummy and get him to sit down and put up his feet. You got a chance in between Commercials, right? Or in between the show. <laughs> I, my wife is so cute. She's like, if you're not looking at me, you're not listening. <laughs> hey, that is so true. That is so true. I find with women, they'll, they, can, they can talk. My girls used to sit, and they would be on the internet and their computers. They'd have their phone in their hands, and they'd have the remote in the other hand. And they'd be watching a show, talking on the phone, typing away on their computers. I, I don't have a big enough brain for that. <laughs> can't do it. If I'm not looking at you, I'm not listening to you. You know, sometimes we have to look at the person and say, is this really necessary? It might be, but is this the right time? Is it necessary at this time? You know, when someone really messes up, isn't the time to say, I told you so. There's a time for everything. But there's not always a time for our commentary. Do you let people finish what they're saying? You know what's really sad about conversation? Nobody's listening a lot of times. Two people talk back and forth, but while that person's talking, you know what it's tempting to do? Think about what you're gonna say next instead of what they're saying. And I find sometimes a pause, or just saying, can I just say something? Just put a pause there. 
silence draws attention. It's hard when it's quiet, isn't it? But it does draw you in. Ranting and raving is never appropriate for a Christian. That's not necessary. You know what I find? My dad used to, he would buy something and if it broke, he'd go back and rant and rave and scream and yell and wonder, what's he going to want this and want that? You know what I found when you walk in and you say, I, I like to return this, and they're like, oh, okay. And you say, how are you? How's your day been? If you treat them like a person, they're going to treat, they're more apt to treat you like a person. I'm, I'm astonished at how many people go in and buy stuff and never say a word. They don't even treat the person on the other side of the counter like a human being. Hey, I like your hair. Of course, I like any hair, you know? But uh, especially like, I used to have a, a girl, in our, a young woman in our church, she, she would dye her hair blue. And of course, she did it for attention, but I would always say, I like it. If I had hair, I think I'd make it blue too. Making people feel like they're wanted, like they're humans, is necessary. Am I beating around the bush? That's not necessary. Is this something I should say in private? The worst place to correct your husband is in public. The worst place to correct your wife is in public. And then for your kids. Or an employee. Is it rash? Is it, is, it, is it impulsive? Am I dominating the conversation? One of the beautiful things about Jesus our Lord is when he talked with people, he didn't assume things. He would ask questions. They would come and say, Rabbi, what about this? And he'd say, how do you read the scriptures? When he sat on a well and he said, can I have a glass of water? You know the neat thing about a question is? Is it puts people at ease. Especially if you say, could I please ask you a question? Would you mind if I comment on what you said to them? You know, when you ask permission, people put their guard down. Is it, is it loving? Is it true? Is it, is, it, is it kind? Is it necessary? We tend to think whatever we have to say is extremely important. And we just think, I wish they'd shut up so I could say this. <laughs> no, no. Sometimes listening is more important than speaking. Amen? Amen? There's a time to tear down and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. Amen? Amen? The final thing, and we're almost done, is, is it clear? Do I know what I'm going to say? Have I thought this through? You know, sometimes I get in big trouble with my jokes. I was teasing the girls when they were little. They were like, Daddy, why do you always feed us mac and cheese and, and uh, you know, all kinds of fattening foods? And I said, so you're fat and the boys won't want to hit on you. <laughs> I was kidding. To this day, they shake their fingers at me. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. But yeah. am I really communicating what I really want to communicate? Now, sometimes we don't realize how deceptive we can be within ourselves and we'll say something because we really just want to hurt them. And we'll say things, but it's true. Well, you need to hear this. No, that wasn't why I said it. I was angry. And that's why I said it. You know, sometimes the final thing of thinking, am I going to say this clearly? You know, for me, I think, I've talked, I remember I'm talking to a woman. She's going to read not just what I'm saying, but how I say it. They're tender hearted. 
Be careful, Ken. Be careful how you say it. Make sure you're communicating the real deal, what's really most important. And that always helps me with my girls, with my wife, to, because I know that the first thing I have to say is, I love you. I care about you. Sweetie, I don't think you meant it that way, but maybe, baby, that's how it sounded to her. Maybe that's why she took it wrong. You know? Maybe, maybe this, maybe that. You know, just, just, just rather than an accusation, but to say what I really, what I really, you know, a lot of times my wife will, will tell me what to do. And I'll tease her. I say, I have a mom, I don't need to. That's a hard, that hurts. That hurts. Because a lot of times she's looking out for me and I, I got, I need looking out for her. I need looking out for her. And saying something like, well, Lord, mom, that, that hurts. Because it, it, it's, it's saying that, that I think she has a bad motive when, no, she doesn't. And thank goodness she looks out for me. Amen? 1 Corinthians 14.9 says, So it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? That's the problem with being angry or hurtful is the tone, we can say, we can think we're hiding it, you know? We think, oh, I can say this and, you know, and, 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 and it'll sound, you know, I, I can say something mean but in a nice way, and, you know, I put a dag in, you know, dagger in there. People are far more smart than we give them credit. Come on, you know when someone's hurting you. Paul says, be clear, in Colossians 4, 3, he says, pray that I may proclaim the gospel in a clear manner as I should. Ecclesiastes uh, 12, 9. He says, um, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. He pondered. He thought. What's the best way to say this? One of the neat things about writing is you have to think concise. You have to think what's the most important thing to say. Is this a run-on sentence? Is it unclear because I'm saying two things in one sentence? What's the main point? It's especially important to talk to people who don't trust us. It's important to be clear. It's, it, it can even be important to say, because I remember as a manager, I used to manage restaurants, and I would, you know, you could tell when people don't like you or they don't trust you, and I would say, you know, I know things aren't right between us, and, but I'm not trying to hurt you, but you need to, could you do this? Could you do that? If you did that, I think you could make more tips, or if you did this, I think, or could you just help me out here? I just really need your help. To be clear, and, and, and put it out there. Put, it, put out there what's going on. Amen? Amen? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Can I say it clearly? You know, sometimes I shouldn't talk because I'm talking. I don't know what I'm trying to say. And I just feel all this stuff in my heart. And I'm just, you know. And the person listening is like, well, <laughs> what are you saying? I just need to go pray about it. I need to think it through. Why is this important? Do you know that 90% of the reasons people fail in life is because it's not because of their skill. Most people who get fired or terminated don't get terminated for their talent, you know, that they don't have the skills. It's they can't get along with other people or they can't tell the truth. How important are our words? Extremely important. That's how we know you. We know you through your words and your actions. So what, what should we do? What, how, do you, how, do I, how do we land this plane, so to speak? We have to make a wholehearted decision to tell the truth, to start being really honest. But speak truth in love. And that's hard. 
That's hard. Because we don't like to think a lot. We like to react. Amen? It's Communion Sunday. It's Communion Sunday. Is everybody served? Is everybody? Everybody? Take a minute if you need to get something. Yeah. Everybody? When I do communion, I often don't go to the Gospels to read what the Last Supper, so to speak. My favorite is in 1 Corinthians because Paul says something that's unique. He says something very unique. He said they sat down and they, they had their, their Passover meal, their Seder meal. And he says, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. But that's what the Gospels say. But Paul adds this line. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, and this is, this is the point, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Now, what I find absolutely fascinating about that is, if we're going to tell the truth, we have to decide to tell the truth all the time. To be honest, and to be honest in love. We have to make the commitment that no matter what the circumstances, no matter how I'm treated, I'm going to be honest and straightforward in love. Amen? And, you know, the best reason, the best reason to be truthful, to teach your children, you know, children, they go through that little lying stage and they, they don't always tell the truth. They, they kind of find fascination with lying. The thing that motivates me the most is, when, especially when people say, well, everybody lies. Remember how I opened the sermon with that? Here's a question to ask them. You make the statement, yeah, everybody lies. When is it okay to lie to you? Well, everybody lies. Yeah, well, when is it okay to lie to you? Because if everybody does it, then it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be important that I tell you the truth then, right? Because we just accept that everybody lies. You know what's fascinating about that question? It makes the point that we should tell the truth because you know what? You deserve the truth. You deserve the truth. The one who was the truth, who is the truth, on the night he was betrayed by all his buddies, wasn't just Judas, all of them fled and left him alone. He stayed true to the truth. He broke the bread. He stayed on mission. He said, he knew they would all betray him. He took the bread, he broke it, and he said, I'm going to let them break me like that. And I'm going to let them break me for you. We're told in scriptures that wives should obey their husbands. Yay! But we're told that husbands should love their lives as Christ loves his bride, the church. You know, that's humbling. It's humble. I don't mind obeying someone who loves, would love me that much. Because I could believe if they love me that much, then what they're asking me to do has got to be the good thing to do, the right thing to do. Now, we often think of communion as Jesus giving himself for us. But here's what I've learned about communion. You know what communion is? It's not just Jesus saying, I break myself for you. It's us reciprocating and saying, and I will, I will let life break me for you, Jesus, by loving my wife when she's in that mood, by putting up with him, doing his thing, by disciplining my kids, by starting off and saying, sweetie, I'm telling you this because it hurts daddy when you lie. You see how you put your heart out there. You fall on your own sword first. 
Are you willing, are you willing to love Jesus the way Jesus loves you? There's nothing more sexy. Husbands, there's nothing more sexy that you can do than to lay your life down for your wife and say, baby, I love you that much. There's, you know, how do you win respect with your child? You show them that no matter what they do, you'll still love them. Jesus said, I know you're all going to betray me, but I'm going to allow myself to be broken for you. Break your bread in half right now. Break it in half. And as you do, pray with me. Jesus, we, we, we are willing to be broken for you, but we know we'll let you down. We've done it so many times. We resemble Judas more than we do you. Help us. Help us. Help us be honest with ourselves and with you and with others. And give us the strength. Partake. Partake. The cup. You know, in the Old Testament, the cup always represented our, our, our deeds, our actions, our sins. The prophets would often come, excuse me, would often come in uh, before kings or before rulers and they would say, the cup of your iniquity is overflowing. It's the cup of judgment. It's the cup that holds our relationship, in a sense, our status with God. This cup should be bitter. It should be almost poisonous, filled with our sins. But you know what scripture says that our Lord drank the bitter cup for us. He switched cups with us. He took our bitter cup full of all of our sins and he drank, drank the dredges of it down. And you know whose cup this is? It's his. It's his. It's his. Our cup killed him. He carried our sins. You know whose cup? This is his cup. And he says, no, you drink. You know, it's like the well was poisoned. But before it, went po it got poisoned, there was one cool, fresh cup of water left. And he drank the poison water. And he said, no, I saved the holy water for you. Are you willing to love that much? That's a scary thing. You know, we're always afraid if we love somebody too much, they'll take advantage. If we love someone too much, somehow it's going to be hurtful. That's crazy. What in the world is wrong with us? The world needs more love, not less. Your wife needs more love. Your husband needs more love. Amen? Amen? If you're willing to love the way you were loved. If you rejoice that the cup is sweet and not bitter, partake. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, on the night you were betrayed, on the night everybody would turn away from you, Everybody in their cowardice and their selfishness would run to save themselves and leave you all alone. You embraced the truth. You cried out to your Abba, to your Papa, that you didn't want to die. But then, after praying three long, grueling hours, you said, not my will, but yours. Lord, that's where it always comes down to. This morning, this morning, there's a decision for us to make about being honest. Whether we will live a life and strive to be honest no matter who we're talking to or what circumstance. Today's the day to step up to a higher commitment with Jesus. If you want more of God's blessing, today's the day to say, I really want more of you, Jesus. But to get more of him, you have to give more of you. Will you be committed to being honest? If we would get our words square, James says, everything else falls in line. 
He says, if you're perfect, if you're mature, if you're holy in your words, you'll live a right life. Jesus, today, today, all of us in this room needs to make a commitment to be honest and truthful, to make sure our truth is lavished with grace and love. We have to ask, Lord, is it true? Is, is what we're going to say true? Is it, is it kind? Is it necessary? Am I communicating it clearly, Lord? Because if we will do that, we'll be closer and closer to you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for these beautiful people in the front of me right here. Thank you for Pastor Myra Joy and uh, her wonderful, wonderful husband, Artur, for the leadership of this church. Let us be a church that people will accuse us of loving others like you love us. We pray this in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus, for the glory of you, Father. May your glory fill this earth. And everyone said? Amen. 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 I believe this is the, I've gone long, and I apologize for that, but uh, what a wonderful opportunity for me. Thank you for letting me come. Um, pray for my wife. Her name is Honey. She's not feeling good today. So pray for her. She's got snipples and all that stuff. I wish she was here, and I wish I could hang around a little longer, but I need to, to go home and take care of my baby. Um, but you all have a great day, okay? Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you.